two astute presenters for our panel this afternoon. Uh, one is Mackenzie Eaglin, who is a senior policy analyst for defense and homeland security at the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. And the other presenter is James Ludis, who is the executive director of the American Security Project, uh, also in Washington, D.C., and a member of the Obama transition team for foreign policy. Now, we, we were discussing which was going to go first, and it looks like uh, Dr. Ludis has won that opportunity. So he is going to present first, Dr. James Ludis. It's a coin toss that I lost, but uh, I want to uh, let you all know what a treat it is for me to be on a panel with Mackenzie. I've, I've known her for, I think, about a decade now in Washington, and she's truly one of the most creative policy minds that I've had the pleasure to work with. Uh, uh, and it's just a real treat for me to be with you today, Mackenzie, so thank you. What I want to do in my, in my brief remarks is share some observations about the initial 100 days of the Obama administration on issues of national security and foreign policy. Uh, at times, I'm going to be tempted to linger into sort of fanciful notions of what might come next, um, and I'm sure that some of you might be too, uh, but I think we need to be mindful of the fact that it is just 100 days. Um, and we can't use that as a real solid baseline for projections into the future. If we think just for a minute about the first 100 days of the George W. Bush administration and what we thought then the major national security issues would be versus what the next eight years entailed, um, we ought to be humbled by the uncertainty of the future. Uh, when I began organizing my thoughts uh, for today, um, I found myself repeatedly asking, asking uh, a couple of questions. Uh, is Obama's presidency on foreign policy and national security revolutionary? Is, is, is the conduct of foreign policy and national security transformative? Or is it merely restorative? Meaning, is it, re, is, it, is it hearkening back to the tried and the true? Is he returning to sound principles or is he breaking new ground? Now, it might be preposterous for us to ask if a foreign policy team made up of the former Commandant of the United States Marine Corps, a Republican Secretary of Defense, and a Secretary of State who accused the President in the primaries of being naive on matters of national security is actually capable of a revolutionary approach to foreign policy. But two things kept coming back to me. First, this President's overseas popularity is a game changer for U.S. foreign policy. At minimum, it makes conversations that wouldn't have happened in the past worth having. And at best, it could lay the foundation for tackling really big issues. Second, this president has shown a propensity, even in the first 100 days, to not shrink from big, thorny issues. We've seen this mostly on the domestic side uh, so far, but we're beginning to get an indication that this is a president who takes seriously the notion that he was sent to Washington to govern not to be a caretaker and kick issues down the road. Now, those two observations, I think, lay the foundation for a presidency which may transform the way we conduct foreign policy, for good or for bad. But major change could be coming, which I, as I was thinking about this last night, I realized is a great betrayal of his campaign slogan, but still. Now, I could also make the case that this president is fundamentally trying to restore something from the past that his administration has in its first 100 days sought to restore balance to American foreign and national security policy, that it has blown the dust figuratively and in some cases literally off fundamental elements of American power that were subject to benign neglect during the Bush administration. Now, two examples leap to my mind. One was a renewed focus on arms control, and the second is the president's skillful use of public diplomacy. On arms control, we've seen the first American president really since Ronald Reagan to speak passionately about creating a world with zero nuclear weapons. He's pledged this country to move in that direction, and he's vowed to re-energize the nonproliferation movement, not with threats of war, but with, a meaning, but with meaningful actions on the part of the United States to lead by example, to get our own house in order before we tell the rest of the world what to do. He's pledged to support reconsideration in the United States Senate of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and he's pledged to work with Russia to negotiate new reductions in nuclear arms this year. 
Now, the specifics of what he's proposed in arms control are, are reflective of, of in, they, they definitely look back to a previous way of doing business. And these are issues that the Bush administration failed really, in my opinion, to develop a, an effective strategy on. Former President Bush signed one arms control agreement in eight years, uh, the so-called Moscow Treaty. And in my humble opinion, it was a dog. I mean, it was a worthless exercise that wasted time in both Washington and Moscow. It basically says that for one minute, on one day, in 2012, the United States and Russia may only have a certain number of warheads made into their delivery systems. And as soon as that minute passes, the treaty goes out of force. There's no verification. There's no monitoring system. And since the treaty really is only in effect for one minute on one day, there's really no penalty for failure to comply. It's worthless. But more importantly to those of us who worry about a whole range of issues, not just proliferation but also terrorism and climate change, to name two, the president's openness on arms control sing signals an openness and a return to international agreements on important issues. It signals an openness to, re to working with other countries and to rely on verifiable enforcement mechanisms and on the value of international treaties and agreements. On public diplomacy, there are a few specific examples. The President's New Year message to the Iranian people, I think, was groundbreaking. His remarks on Middle East peace and his recent visit to Turkey. But I think more importantly, it's the tone that this President has set and his approach that's so important to our ability to meet new challenges. We saw it on display in the president's recent trip to Europe. He challenged the world to do more on the financial crisis. He challenged NATO to do more in Afghanistan. And while he certainly didn't get everything he wanted, he did win concessions on the size of the global financial stimulus, and he did win additional contributions for trainers for Afghanistan's security forces. Did the president and his advisors want more? I think it's safe to say that yes, they did. But rarely in politics do you get 100% of what you want. The truth is that I'm not convinced that there's a lot more of additional capability that NATO countries could have brought. They could certainly loosen some of the restrictions they have on how their forces can operate inside Afghanistan. But the limits now, are, the limits in place now are really a reflection of European politics and the public attitudes in those countries about a war and the chilling effect that that has had on their governments to risk greater numbers of casualties. That's why the president's considerable skills in public diplomacy are so refreshing. Our closest allies are democracies. They are responsive to the will of their publics. We cannot expect them to show any more political courage than we're capable of showing ourselves. Now, Machiavelli and maybe Vice President Cheney argued that it's better to be feared than it is to be loved. But I've always found a certain wisdom in, the, in, in, in what's said of the United States Marines who are said to be no greater friend and no greater foe. Being loved or maybe it's just being respected enhances our power and security. That's why restoring American public diplomacy is so important. When I was in high school, there was a member of the local board of education who was fond of asking, do we really need two more computers? As the technological revolution of the last 20 years was taken off, he used to say, do we really need two more computers? It was a, a, a penny-wise and pound-foolish approach to education. Well, a few, years after, uh, a, few, a few years after that, while democracy was spreading, the Berlin Wall was coming down, Cold War was ending, Responsive and representative governments were springing up all over the world. And in a similar penny-wise and pound-foolish approach, the United States killed the U.S. Information Agency. In that one move, Congress and the President conspired to eliminate the one agency of government whose function and purpose every day was growing vital with every day. U the U.S. Information Agency was a, a creation of the Cold War. It was intended to bring American policy, and to talk directly to populations around the world. If those governments are now responsive to the will of the public, we need to be talking to those people. And we threw that capability away. If we believe everything we, preach about, everything we preach about democracy around the world, then our communication must be with those publics, not just their governments. 
USIA existed for that purpose, and we threw it away in the mid-90s. If I may offer one hope about the next 100 days or the next couple of years, it's that restoring that capability will be one of the top priorities of the president. I think it's too soon for us to pass judgment on the foreign policy and national security policies of, of, of President Obama. The first 100 days have shown us glimmers of transformative potential, careful prudence on complex issues, and a return to internationalism. Ultimately, I find myself looking at a president who brings both idealism and realism to the table. I see someone who is anchored in American values and so says we have to close Guantanamo Bay and end the use of torture. We have to restore the rule of law. But who's also aware of the unique challenges of modern security threats. So he says, we're not going to do it willy-nilly. We're going to conduct a thorough review. We're going to put in place a new process, a new method for determining who's set free, who's prosecuted, who do we have to hold. Fundamentally, I think his policies are motiv motivated by a great pragmatism and a desire to move beyond the great immovable issues of the past. So we see him taking strides on Cuba, on Iran, and ultimately, I expect, we'll see it on the Middle East peace process, too. Let me close with just one other observation. If I had to pick one, one if, I, if I had to pick the most striking feature of this president after 100 days, it's this. He's confident and comfortable enough in his own person and in his own judgments that he can give voice to opposing views even in public. Watch his press conferences or his speeches. It's a remarkable trait and one that I don't think analysts have considered enough. It's, a, it's, it's that trait that has enabled him to say, yes, the deficit is a problem, but we need more deficit spending now because of the economic crisis. Yes, Iranian nuclear ambitions are a concern, maybe even a threat, but insisting they stop work on those ambitions before we talk to them has only let them build more and more centrifuges and advance their capability. And yes, I'm going to end the war in Iraq, but I'm not going to do so irresponsibly. In these contrasts, we find a leadership style that is in stark contrast to that of the decider. Obama's style is really that of a community organizer. He sees a problem and he educate, educates us about it so that together we can organize and unify and solve it. To lead, he educates and then he brings us along. It was a hallmark of how he campaigned. It appears to be a hallmark of how he governs as president and in my own experience, it's fairly unique in Washington. Thank you for your time. Well, thanks for having me. I want to echo Jim's comments and, and uh, thank the congressman and UCF and all of you for being here and my friend John. Jim is one of the first people I met literally in Washington, D.C. 10 years ago. And so it is also my distinct pleasure to be up here today with him. I am a conservative and I work at a conservative think tank. I'm not so far right wing that I might be labeled an extremist by DHS, but I will offer a little bit of dose of reality <laughs> this morning on, not necessarily on Obama the person, because I, that, 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 why would anyone want to attack anyone as a person? But I do want to have a, a more um, pragmatic discussion of his policies, at least what we know of them so far, because I thought Jim really touched on a theme about, you know, being loved and by extension possibly being respected and how that can be very helpful and maybe even increase security. I love Jim. He's wrong. <laughs> I, I, I'm more of the walk softly, carry a big stick. We actually, I sat through the last panel and uh, the term world soul superpower came up often. That superpower status is not a birthright. There's no guarantee it will continue. It actually requires maintenance and investment on the soft side of things, foreign aid, public diplomacy, USIA, for example, which I totally agree with you on that. Uh, but you got to have a hard side to match and marry with your, all your soft power, which of course includes, in this case, your military capabilities. If you ask a foreign policy question to a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington, they're going to tell you, you know, that's above their pay grade. We have a civilian control of the military. We are really a tool of foreign policy, and that is correct. Defense policy is subordinate to foreign policy as it should be. 
But in, in the first 100 days, granted, with some fairness to the short timeline that it is, I'd say, what foreign policy? Because we really don't have one yet. You have a Secretary of Defense, Dr. Robert Gates, out in front using a military tail to wag the global strategy dog. Because we don't have a foreign policy explicitly, directly, on paper from this president. We have no national security strategy. So we really have the Pentagon out in front, which uh, I think they actually, and, and, and being one who works with them every day, it's completely inappropriate. Secretary Gates is a cabinet official. He takes his orders from the White House. Uh, but in this case, it seems that he's telling President Obama the orders, and I think there's something wrong with this inverted chain of command. There's increasing frustration in Washington among the leaders of the military because they have the job of preparing America to accomplish its strategic mission in the post-Cold War world, which is interesting. We're still calling it that 20 years later. And they're not sure what that mission is. They've resorted to deducing, inferring the last 20 years what the national military strategy should be based on a lot of current operations. But let's just take the past 20 years. Uh, we've done a lot of nation building, not just Iraq, Afghanistan, but let's, let's throw Bosnia in. But then the military is so often criticized for being slow to adjust to these new requirements in part because, again, there's no overarching definitive strategy. Of course, that situation was completely the opposite, contrasted to the Cold War days when Western democracies knew who they were and what they wanted to accomplish. Presidents from Truman to Reagan. And of course, the associated alliances and institutions that Jim also referenced that were many were built up during that time, have proved some enduring for a good reason to this day. But yet, as Jim mentioned, our friendly allied countries, many of them democracies, they do have a voter constituency, a domestic uh, group that they, have, they are accountable, more so than, say, NATO or the EU or the UN. But back in the Cold War days, since we had this sort of a unified position on, on what the free world wanted and what was the potential threat to that existence and achieving these goals, policymakers around the world were able to communicate to that, that to their voting publics. And together, I wouldn't say it was kumbaya, but it certainly was, it was more coherent. Now, many people in Washington, and I fight this argument every day, it seems, think as part of this, as part of the a strong foreign policy, by extension, you need a strong military. Many people actually think the armed forces should be weaker. A military capable of fighting desert storm, combating terrorism, containing national ambitions from states like Russia and China, stopping genocidal regimes, and performing a myriad of missions currently assigned to our military is at best unnecessary and at worst a threat to American interests and freedom. Now, that's a fair position. Uh, but, like I said, the military shouldn't be out front in deciding this. If America's too prominent or too interventionist in world affairs, the answer is to fundamentally change American foreign policy, not to weaken the armed forces and the belief that degrading those capabilities will force the U.S. to limit the scope of its global leadership. But I'd argue that's exactly what's happening in Washington. Ironically, yes, under a Republican, so-called Secretary of Defense, he served under so many presidents, I'd call him a chameleon, not a Republican. I'd argue what is needed is a full debate about America's strategic mission in the world. We have no consensus in Washington about the threat or the threats, and that's the problem. If we can't have a conversation about that and then decide what this, the, the, the national mission, what do we want America to be? Do we want to continue to be a global superpower? And what kind of investment that requires? And we'll continue to disagree because I'd argue a lot of the things I work on, actually, we don't have a lot of disagreement in Washington on pure defense policy issues. Foreign policy, different story, of course. Now, there are risks inherent in American global leadership. But there's no safety in passivity either. Uh, the American government largely ignored the terrorist threat in the 1980s and the 90s precisely because we were unable to foresee how that movement constituted a major threat to the U.S. Of course, we all know about 9-11. It was my first day at the Pentagon. It was quite a day. 
And of course, nothing's been the same since. A lot of times people will say, well, McKinsey, America's allies should do more. Jim touched on this as well. And in fact, Obama's, of course, trip um, to Europe has, has been a constant refrain. What he did and didn't get out of it for all of you today. And I hope we can talk more about that. And yes, allies should do more. They can and they should, but they don't. So until they do, do we want to reduce our own investments? The vast majority of America's European allies are not keeping the minimal commitments that they have made even to NATO, which is directly responsible for protecting their own security. We now see an overlapping European security and defense policy being developed and by extension for structure affiliated with that. It's unclear what this means, but it certainly looks like it will ultimately weaken NATO's structure and by extension the alliance. While the risks confronting the U.S. have changed since the end of the Cold War, I, had argue, I would argue America's strategic objectives have not. And the need for American leadership in securing those objectives is clearer than ever. To be sure, leadership roles require certain capabilities that are not military in nature. Jim and I agree here. Effective international alliances, public diplomacy, economic power, various tools of soft power, or smart power, depending on the way we're describing it. But all of these non-military tools depend on the participation of America's armed forces. Economic sanctions have to be enforced. Humanitarian aid must be delivered. And as America learned in Japan, Germany, Bosnia, Iraq, and now in Afghanistan, territory must be made safe before the institutions of democracy can be built. The foundation for foreign policy success is the world's confidence that the United States can swiftly and effectively defeat any substantial threat to our nation and our allies. One man alone, albeit a confident president, cannot do this without everything that's just been laid out. Without that confidence, and by extension, all of those capabilities, most specifically a strong military, America will be increasingly be attacked by its enemies. We won't be more secure, we'll be less will be challenged by competitors and abandoned by our friends. The tools of soft power can't operate alone. You actually, when you increase your soft power, you increase your hard power. Take the provincial reconstruction teams in Iraq, for example, in, in Afghanistan. I just traveled there about a year ago. And as we saw in Iraq, at the height of violence, NGOs and, and nonprofits were just pulling out or not going altogether because they were, they were unsafe. Same thing's going on in Afghanistan. So the military's running 10 of the 12 on the ground there. Soft power needs hard power. Your NGOs, your nonprofits, your, your uh, Red Crosses of the world, your Red Crescents, they need security. They need to operate. They need to be alive to deliver aid or to help people rebuild. The tools of soft power cannot by themselves prevent the architecture of peace from coming apart at the seams. I look forward to a longer discussion on these issues and, frankly, reiterating some of the points of agreement that I share with my colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eaglin. Thank you, Dr. Ludus. And uh, we'll be happy to take questions from the audience at this point. Yes. It's a microphone coming. Hello, my question goes out to, is this on? All right. My question goes out to both speakers on the panel uh, regarding uh, whether or not its success or failure in Afghanistan will determine NATO's relevance as a military alliance in world affairs. Can you hear me? Great. That's a, it's an excellent question. Uh, in many ways, yes. Uh, I, I think that there's collective agreement within the alliance that success or failure in Afghanistan will largely shape the future of the alliance, how, and particularly, of course, its strength or whether it needs to be completely rethought. Um, the, the dilemma here is that it's, it's kind of like when the Army made the case to Congress back in 2003 when we didn't have enough... Um, troops in Iraq saying, we need to grow the army. 
because we can't meet our missions that the nation is asking us to carry out in Iraq. Well, the dilemma is now that we're going to draw down in Iraq, the army's going to end up losing that force structure, which they should have never made the case in Iraq. It should have been, we're too small to begin with for a superpower. We have, you know, a million point two people. That's not that big for a nation of over 300 million. The problem with Afghanistan and hinging success or failure for the alliance on that is, is just that. Uh, the, the alliance should, members should look beyond Afghanistan. Now, granted, success should be absolutely the highest priority. We're, we're, in theory, we're in it together. However, with all the caveats and the unwillingness to fight at night and the unwillingness to send combat forces by many of the NATO nations, I'd argue we're not all in it fully together. But the case for the alliance should be made beyond Afghanistan. And because we're so far out there publicly now that it's not, they're inextricably linked. So let's cross our fingers for success. Yeah. I mean, I, there's, it, it's not news, certainly not recent news, that, that the European members of NATO have uh, grossly underfunded uh, their investments in, in defense. Um, and it manifests itself in really pernicious ways. I mean, um, you can't operate in Afghanistan really without helicopters. And the Europeans just don't have enough. Um, and, and they impose very stringent rules on when their forces can be employed, under what circumstances. Uh, when I was working in the Pentagon on the transition, I heard a story about a uh, uh, one NATO ally who refused to fly their helicopters after dark. Uh, and people were losing their lives. These were better back helicopters. Um, and people were losing their lives because the, this, this country would not let their pilots fly after dark. Well, you know, the, 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 the Taliban and, 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 and other groups that are there, Al-Qaeda and other groups that are there, um, don't stop shooting after dark. Um, and so that there's, it's, it's one part capabilities, but a lot of it has to do with, as, as I suggested in my comments, really the domestic political issues inside uh, those European countries. There is no uh, appetite for increased defense spending, which would, which would buy you greater capability. But there's also not a lot of appetite for, for casualties. Uh, the governments that have exposed themselves to that political liability, even if it's an act of political courage, have paid for it in the polls. Uh, and we saw that in, uh, in, in Spain uh, after, uh, uh, after their commitment in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, it, it, we have to understand these are democracies. And it, that's why the point that I was making was about the need to engage with the public to inform them uh, so that you change the politics inside those countries as much as you do the minds of the, of the leaders. Yes, over here. Hi. Um, to Ms. Eaglin, uh, I was wondering, you, your primary criticism of Obama seems to be that he uh, doesn't use hard power or only uses uh, soft power. He uh, seemed to have no problem using military force for the recent pirate incident, and he's also increasing our troop count in Afghanistan. So how can you say that uh, he doesn't like to use hard power enough for your, your criticism? Well, not that he doesn't like to use hard power, uh, but it's about frankly, a longer-term investment required in the hard power that I'd argue he's lacking, and he's, it's, it's really being led by the defense secretary. To maintain the capabilities resident in the U.S. military today requires an investment, and what he's doing is cutting our investment in next-generation equipment and technology, everything from ships to planes to tanks to trucks, and that's the problem. I would argue he really didn't have a whole lot of choice about the pirate, the, the pirate situation. Um, so the, I, the, I'm not going to give him credit or no credit. He just that, that situation is what it is. But his investment, as demonstrated by last week's press conference by the Secretary and the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs uh, in Defense, is will ensure that we become a declining military power once those investment choices become reality, which typically takes about five to ten years. So. The secretary will be out of office when that actually happens. Obama may not even be in office when it happens. And that's, that's the problem with military investments. Those who make the poor decisions often have long since moved on and maybe even are enjoying the sunny days of retirement once, um, once their decisions manifest into reality. And the dilemma for those in uniform is that it typically is measured, this declining investment, in terms of lives or just 
or other types of casualties? Um, if I could just provide a little comment on this. Um, I think this is the first time, well, it's not the first time in history, but it's, it's remarkable that an increase in defense spend, spending, which is about a 4% increase over last year, is been heralded as a draconian cut that's going to make us less safe. What the secretary, what the secretary described, which is remarkably consistent with everything that candidate Obama said on the campaign trail, was that we need to refocus investment on the near to midterm because we are fighting two wars. We do have great unmet needs inside the force today, not five years from now, not ten years from now, today. So let's refocus the investment on what we need now to help those war fighters who are deployed and in harm's way. And we'll worry about the mid to long term implications of that in a year or two or five. It, there's, there's nothing in Washington that says that anything is ever set in stone. Um, people are, are supposed to be able to exercise good judgment, review things, review developments as they arise. Um, President Obama uh, during the campaign spoke about a need to increase the capacity to perform the types of missions that the intelligence community has been saying for a year, for, excuse me, for a decade, uh, are, likely, are likely to be uh, 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 required of the United States military. And those are stability operations. Those are what the military euphemistically has called operations other than war. And that's a slight way of giving a dig at doing the types of things that, that we've been doing, frankly, for the last eight years. It's less than war. It's less than manly. It's less than ought to be asked of our sons and daughters. Now, you can believe that, but that's what we've asked them to do. Let's give them the stuff they need to get it done. And that's the fundamental issue. On the longer-term issue about the, 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 the uh, sacrificing the, the capabilities that we're going to need in the near to midterm, um, it's, a, it's a fair point that McKenzie makes. And, and Secretary Gates recognized that they were accepting increased risk in the mid to long term uh, because of, of immediate operational needs right now. Um, I think the fundamental question that we have to ask ourselves when we have a debate about defense, though, is what do you expect the principal threats to American national security to be? And what role will the Department of Defense play in those things? Now, if, 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 you're, if, you're supp if, you're, if your presumption going into that conversation is that you're going to fight China over the Taiwan Straits, or you're going to have to push Russia back in Eastern Europe, or a vastly more capable Iran confronts the United States in the Middle East, or some other scenario like that, then McKenzie's right. But the fact of the matter is that today the United States spends 45% of global defense spending. The next nearest competitor is the United Kingdom, our closest ally, which spends 5%. We spend more, three times more, than the next two powers combined. So the notion that we are making ourselves incredibly unsafe by rebalancing on the present seems to me to be miss the forest for the trees. Did you have a response you wanted to share, McKenzie? Uh, I'm, I, I think it will come up naturally. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm actually glad the issue of uh, piracy came up because in recent months this has really registered in many people's minds. And uh, I'm curious as to what your perspective, uh, both of you, is. Uh, toward, and clearly this is not a security issue on the order of Iraq and Afghanistan and Al Qaeda and so forth, but it is a security issue. And some people are saying, you know, by by using military force, we're we're swatting wasps rather than going after the the source, the the wasp nest, mm -hmm. uh, to paraphrase a famous uh, former British uh, official. But at any rate, any thoughts on this topic as to what we might or could be doing? You, can, you want to go first? Oh, sure, sure. Um, I, you know, I, the, I have to be honest with you that um, I, I think that we're that we're that we're swatting at flies. Um, I, I think that this is a uh, it, it is a serious issue for uh, um, uh, for merchantmen who are transiting uh, those stretches of ocean that are suspect to it. Um, the scale of the problem is such though that unless we want to pretty much deposit the entire all the assets of the United States Navy. Uh, in that little part of the world, um, it's a big ocean, uh, lots of ships, and uh, I don't, I don't think it's a wise use of our resources to say we're going to address it on sea. Now, there are lots of folks who have come out of the woodwork in the last week who have said we need to tackle this issue on land, uh, which to me uh, sounds like a horrible idea. Um, at this point, I, look, we've, we're, we're fighting uh, a global Islamist insurgency, okay? 
we are already engaged in two land wars in Islamic countries. We're going to add a third. Um, there, are, there are consequences at the strategic level for that broader struggle against extremists that we need to consider when we're talking about addressing pirates who, are, who, are, who, who frankly, unless we're going to occupy Somalia, uh, I don't see how we're going to solve this problem with the United States military. I, I agree on most points. I mean, it, using, using U.S. destroyers to escort cargo ships is completely irrational and, by the way, wholly unaffordable. And, third, the Navy just isn't that big. If we sent the entire U.S. Navy, they still can't cover all the ground in that one part of the world. Um, so it's, it's not a Navy solution, I can tell you that. Um, in fact, it, the Somali, well, it's, there's a couple things. It's, it certainly requires an international effort. It's in every country's interest to maintain freedom of the seas and freedom of movement. I mean, we're talking basically, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but basically like three quarters of like the world's trade moves on the, and above the seas. So it's, it's in everyone's interest. I don't know why the U.S. Navy is, is solely responsible. In fact, the U.S. Coast Guard, however, does have a, a significant role to play. Our Coast Guard is international. Everyone thinks they, they're just, you know, out here on the coast of Florida trying to give you a, you know, a ticket or something, but that they're not. In fact, our Coast Guard looks like many of the world's navies, and they have these sort of institutional and diplomatic relationships already with a lot of these countries, uh, maritime relationships, and, and there's a role of the private sector to play here. And then, of course, there's, there's the root cause issue that John laid out, and it's true. And unless we are willing to address the, you know, the, the, the root of the piracy problem and go after the bases in Somalia, the home operations, which I see no national commitment or will to do here in America, then I, I don't know what we're talking about. Um, I just think it's all been really silly and overblown as far as what the solutions are, because I don't see us de devoting the entire U.S. Navy to it or going into Somalia, as Jim laid out. My question um, was, Ms. Eaglin said that the Obama administration has no overarching definitive foreign policy, and I was wondering what your rebuttal to that was, Dr. Lutz. Um, it, uh, I think that, I think Mackenzie's right. I don't believe that they've issued a national security strategy yet. There's a requirement in law that it has to be done, I think, in the first three months or so. So it's, 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 it's coming. I know that uh, in the planning, in the initial planning for the Quadrennial Defense Review, which is DOD's look at it, uh, that, that uh, they anticipated receiving inputs from the White House in, ter in, the, in the form of a national security strategy um, in that time frame. Uh, the, uh, if you want to understand what Barack Obama has been saying about national security, though, you can go back and actually take a look at what he has said throughout the campaign because it, it was remarkably consistent. If you look at the Foreign Affairs article that he wrote last summer or the uh, speech he gave in Chicago in April, I believe, of 2007, uh, they were, those are pretty coherent and consistent statements. Um, I th it, but but as, for, as far as a formal document goes, Mackenzie's right. There's, there has not been that clear statement yet. Yes, over here. Hello. With regard to uh, cyber warfare, what are our strategic options? Wow. You guys are full of good questions. Um, I'm back. <laughs> I'm worried. I'm just going to start by saying I'm very worried about this issue in general and, frankly, our, our inability to do much. We're, we're just – we lack – it's so multifaceted. You have to understand the hardware, not just the software of cyber, because we, my, my colleague Peter Brooks is a member of the U.S.-China Commission, and we have lots of public panels and events on this issue, and, and if you don't know how the BlackBerry works or, or the, the, the stick that I brought to bring remarks on, they, when they're built, you can actually embed spyware in those. So if you, I mean, it's, it's so, so you have to, it's everything from the hardware to the software, and it also, of course, leads into warfare. 
and and we have not even come close to putting our arms around it as, as in, on a federal government policy level. It was really ad hoc and, and, and scattershot under the Bush administration. I believe technically the Department of Homeland Security is the lead federal agency for this issue, but it's it's <laughs> – and, and they have relationships with the private sector because that's really what it's going to come down to. Is it's going to have to be private sector led, but it's it's still incoherent and it's not there as we've seen um, actually recently. I mean, when you have members of Congress and Veterans Administration and every federal government agency, IRS even, getting hacked into every day, I mean, it's clearly there's a problem. And that's not even touching on Russia-Georgia conflict and, frankly, what, what started as a cyber war and was quite effective. And the fact that China is literally building cyber warriors and, you know, when they have the ability to take down a satellite that every single soldier, sailor, airman, and marine in the U.S. military needs to do everything. Uh, we're, we're, we're in a bind. Um, I don't have the answer. <laughs> I just know it's a really big problem, and we're only starting to think about it, and, and we're, we're way behind. The, the, if, uh, if you hadn't seen it, go, Google it. There was a, uh, a, a – just the last two weeks a story broke about a Canadian think tank that was able to identify like 22 lines of code that is mysteriously appearing in servers uh, and, and on computers at uh, embassies and uh, 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 critical infrastructure sites all over the world. Um, they, they fell upon it because of uh, 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 some Tibetan activists asked them to look at their servers because they thought the Chinese seemed to know a lot that was going on. Um, uh, it's a remarkable story, so I'd say check that out. But I, I agree with Mackenzie. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, over here. Hi. Um, conventional wars in China and Eastern and Eastern Europe were brought up. I was wondering, in that event, if you thought um, the theaters in Iraq and Afghanistan would even be su sustainable, if well, that ever occurred. My, my whole point in bringing them up, I don't, I don't think. Let's phrase this very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think – I do not see it as likely that there is going to be a conflict between the United States and China. I think it would be a disaster for both countries. I don't think that there's likely to be a, a, a post-Soviet revival in Eastern Europe. I think that those are, that those are uh, fanciful notions from a time that's already passed. I brought those examples up uh, to very – try to gently critique the perspective <laughs> of, of my friend here uh, because I just have a different opinion of the, of the threat base that we're looking at in the future. So um, so I, I don't want to mislead you on that front. Yes. Oh, right over here. Sorry. I'm trying to look around. But he, she's coming. You start. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you go to the table thinking that you're going to take everything they say at face value. Uh, that, that's 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 the end is not the negotiation. The negotiation is a means. You you, you want to bring them to the table so that uh, you can you can. Ex I mean, fundamentally, this is a question of uh, what are you willing to do? All right? Are you willing to launch airstrikes in Iran? Maybe a possibility. Maybe a requirement. Right. Are you willing to occupy Iran, a country the size of France? Okay. Uh, we're stressed with Iraq and Afghanistan. Okay. Are you willing to let the Israelis do it? Well, you know, there are a lot of smart people that I respect who say, look, if anybody's going to do it, it can't be the Israelis because they have to live in that neighborhood. Okay. Uh, so what are your other options? So if, if, the ultimate, if the ultimate weapon that you wield is the use of armed force, and it may come to that, but if the ultimate weapon you wield is that, 
and it has a whole host of negative, unintended, secondary, and, th and, and, and tertiary uh, consequences, then why wouldn't you exhaust the opportunity to talk to them first? That's the fundamental question. It's not, this is not a reward for good behavior. It's not saying we're going to take their word at face value. It means let's talk to them. And if we can't resolve it, well, then we still have the, the option to go to force. But what we did over the last eight years was we said, well, we're just not going to talk to you. Stop what you're doing or we're not going to talk to you. And instead now, after that period of time, we now know that Iran has at least 5,000 centrifuges. That's industrial, that's an industrial scale enrichment facility um, that is uh, going to be capable of building enough, uh, producing enough uh, 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 highly enriched uranium for one to two bombs a year. So not talking to them didn't work. I say let's talk to them before we let loose the dogs of war. Yeah. Do you want to repeat the question? Yeah. So the question is, should we engage in uh, multilateral or bilateral talks with the Iranians? And you know, I, I think that uh, I think that the president's approach has been about right out on this. Is that we begin to talk to them on a variety of different issues. We engage with them on the issue of Afghanistan, which in 2001, in early 2002, the Iranians were actually very helpful uh, in the initial phases of Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, so we're going to talk to them about that. And then we're going to re-engage with them, it looks like. I don't know if it's been formally announced yet. I know it's been speculated upon. But the United States will re-engage uh, in, the, in, the, in the multilateral talks on Iran's nuclear program uh, with our European allies and the Russians. I think that's the right way to go. I don't think there's a, a real upside for doing it bilaterally. Jim raises a really strong, fair point, which is talking is not the same as negotiating. And he didn't actually say that. I'm saying it, but I'm... I'm <laughs> That's what I would take away in agreement with him. Uh, but but you're right. I mean, there's the eyes wide open here going into any talks. Um, the, the good news with Iran is that Ahmadinejad really doesn't wield a lot of power, right? It's the ruling, uh, the, the religious ruling regime. So I, I, I don't get overly concerned with all his uh, flamboyant rhetoric, which granted is pretty, pretty destructive and, yeah, just over the top. Um, but nonetheless, I think when you engage in this sort of, and, and I think George Bush fell trapped to this, engaging with this um, saber-rattling verbal war with each other, you just give him more power domestically by just even acknowledging the stupid things he says. Um, the, but, but I don't want to stop. I mean, it's a problem. It, the, the enrichment is a problem. I, I Married with North Korea's successful testing of its... Um, rocket launch, the satellite part of the, the recent test is completely irrelevant, so let's not even talk about that. What they were testing is their ability to move forward on a ballistic missile trajectory, and they're now in the third phase, and that is significant progress, and they will share that with Iran. So I'm very, very nervous. But um, I, I was on a trip to the Middle East about a year and a half ago with my colleagues at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and we went to the United Arab Emirates and the, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and we had all these private meetings, and the only thing that everyone, we want to talk about Iraq, we want to talk about our security commitments with our Gulf allies, it's a lot of issues, and Iran was the number one topic, and we were basically told in no uncertain terms, once Iran obtains a nuclear capability, you will see every Gulf ally obtain the same. We will literally have a Middle East arms race. At the same time, we're going to say we're going to disarm nuclear. So I, I'm, I'm worried. I, 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 I'm not advocating the use of military force, but I'm very concerned. And and, and it, act, it just it has to be stopped. I don't know. I don't have all the answers. We're actually putting a report together at Heritage right now about trying to do that. But it's a problem. But you, you brought up North Korea, and I think it would be appropriate to focus on that for a while. North Korea has chased the IAEA inspectors out. It's pulled out of the multi-party talks, et cetera, et cetera. Where are we with North Korea? What, what was wrong? What was right with what the Bush administration did? What was wrong? What was right with what the Clinton administration did? What should this administration do? Well, I, the, I think that the, so I'm going to give myself a little commercial here. Uh, in August, uh, I'm publishing a book called uh, Iraq Uncensored, which is a horrible name that the publisher insisted upon. <laughs> But it's really about lessons learned from the Iraq conflict. 
And one of the lessons that we have to draw from the Iraq conflict is that UN arms inspections work. The, there were no WMD in Iraq. Uh, the UN inspection system after the first Gulf War eradicated their programs. Did they maintain intellectual ability to, to build those systems back? Yes, but they didn't. And so when we're talking about Iran and when we're talking about North Korea, if we're not willing to go to, to go to the use of force immediately, our objective has to be to get the UN's arms inspectors back into both places uh, because they can be effective. Uh, the agreed framework in 1994 um, was, uh, you know, shut down the, the North Korean program, uh, the, uh, the plutonium program, uh, but uh, Ambassador Gallucci, who negotiated the agreed framework, said in testimony before Congress, he was asked, what do you think that the North Koreans going to do? He said, they're going to cheat. They're going to go to your uranium enrichment program. But that's what they did. Um, so, it, you know, there's, there's, uh, there are practical limits if you're not there's, – there's a line in Hamlet, right? You cannot take that which I would not give except my life. You know, the use of force is the final arbiter. And if you're willing to cross that threshold, then, yeah, everything's on the table. But if there are other reasons why you're not willing to do that, then you've got to find other mechanisms to achieve your own means. That might be talking to them. It might be taking things back to the United Nations. It doesn't mean it's easy. It's not efficient. It's hard, hard work. But it might be the only option you have. Any comment? Other questions? Over here. Yes, uh, is one of our problems is, uh, is the fact that we don't know how to fight a non-traditional war. We know how to fight a Russia, other countries. In Vietnam, we found an elusive enemy. We didn't do very well there. We're now in a situation where we're fighting a enemy, but we don't know exactly what it is, the Taliban, okay? They don't value life or at least they don't seem to value life, they'll blow themselves up. And uh, we're looking at countries where, like Pakistan, where we're pouring a ton of money in there. We, we seem to be favorable with the government that's in rule there. We're afraid that if we push that government too far, we'll get something worse that's not in uh, alignment with us. So we're playing the cat and mouse game of sending a lot of money into that country, mm -hmm. trying to influence them into uh, letting us go into their borders, uh, the poorest border. Uh, the government is afraid to give us too much uh, to recognize our ability to go in there. So we're sending predators over there, and they're turning their head. Uh, we don't know how to fight in that kind of environment. And... Uh, uh, the, to fight a traditional war, we know how to build ships. We know how to build airplanes. Uh, we don't know what the uh, instant uh, attack force that they're trying to develop. The, the Army's having a heck of a time with that and trying to get, get that funded and knowing exactly what that's supposed to be. I don't think we know how to fight our enemy. Let's Is see what our true? panelists think on that to wrap up because we're almost out of time. So quick comment and we're done. Uh, we, after Vietnam, the U.S. basically shut its irregular warfare capability saying, well, we're never, we're never going to do that again. So we don't need to keep that skill set, by extension, equipment resident in the U.S. military, particularly the U.S. Army. And, of course, now that we're uh, – Iraq and Afghanistan have – we're right back to that sort of stage, except this time we're saying, no, no, no. We're going to actually try and institutionalize those capabilities in our people and our systems because the future will inevitably hold more of the same, more irregular conflicts, more uh, less non-conventional competitors, basically. We're really bad at predicting the future in the U.S. Uh, intelligence failures outnumber by 100 to 1 our ability to predict, predict with precision the next threat. So... I, I'm, I don't know that that's an accurate assumption, um, but nonetheless, we, it's been a challenge. Um, it's not, it's, and it, what's interesting is it's not the military's fault. Um, when a, 
I was in we, I was in the eastern part of Afghanistan, and I, we were having all these briefings, and it was all we always talked about the security, and of course the threat, and Taliban, Al Qaeda, and then other um, militant foreign fighters. But then we would talk about economic development and governance of Afghanistan. It was a, they, they likened it to a three-legged stool. So you could win all the military side you want, but the, the stool will not stand up without these other two. Well, that's a pretty big undertaking. And nothing was talked about, and that was over a year ago, and nothing was talked about in terms of achieving any of those objectives because they're so huge before 2020. Now, the problem with George Bush was he didn't delineate that to all of us. And so if you're not telling your people that, again, another lesson from Vietnam, then you're not going to have the political will for it. That's part of the issue. And, and as a nation, you know, can we even achieve economic development and good, good governance with a friendly country in Afghanistan, we may, that may be unachievable. Maybe we have to scale back those goals. I don't know. But, but I, the military is actually pretty decent today at, at a regular warfare. It was, it was hard learned to come back. There's no doubt about it. We saw that in Iraq primarily um, for the first four years. But um, I think as a nation, we're, we're not really good at communicating what our goals and objectives have been in both these wars. Uh, sir, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think we don't understand our enemies, and I think that we don't understand exactly uh, how to fight this type of conflict. I think that the – what Mackenzie said is absolutely right. I, would, I made some notes here. It's, uh, it basically uh, anticipated what, what, what I was thinking here. You know, the, the, the fundamental question now is uh, are we – not, not are we going to do more Iraqs, but are we going to need to – do we need to have that kind of capability going forward? Are the challenges that we're going to face around the world – Pick, pick your remote corner of the world, but you look at the trends and the stresses caused by globalization, revolutions in information technology, a resurgence of religious fervor around the world. If these are the types of conflicts that we expect to see over the next 15 to 20 years, regardless of whether or not we ever want to fight them again, but if that's a capability we need to have, then to go back to how our conversation started about the defense budget, what Secretary Gates has laid out and what, Senator, and what President Obama uh, is, is talking about in terms of our investments in national security – that's the type of future that they're building for. Um, and uh, I guess I'll just leave it at that. For now. Okay, well, thank you, Ms. Eagle. Thank you, Dr. Lutus.